for a more coordinated and joined up approach in situations of protracted um, conflict and also complex environments. My name is Ozong Abbasanaya Fitu. I am a Chief Operations Officer at the African Development Bank, and I am particularly delighted to be moderating this session for two reasons, because it builds on a 2023 director's level um, OECD INCAF meeting. INCAF, as you know, is the um, International Net Network for Conflict and Violence. And it also builds on a crucial session with um, OECD at the Africa Resilience Forum, the, the fifth edition of the Africa Resilience Forum, which was just recently in Abidjan. Many of you were there, so happy to see you um, back here so we can continue that discussion. The topic for today is finding peace in the nexus. Finding peace in the nexus, balancing um, humanitarian action, security, and development. Um, we have quite an esteemed panel, and I'm going to start by inviting um, Eloise Watson with OECD to explain to us why we're having this session and also provide some context, context um, for, for this, this um, conversation with, and, and how, how it fits into the OECD um, INCAF dialogue on peace and development, also the economics of conflict, et cetera, et cetera. Eloise, I'm, I'm here. here. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> right behind you. Very good. Okay. okay. <laughs> um, very briefly, um, I don't want to take time from our important panelists. So Eloise Watson, I work for the, the OECD's Crisis, Conflict and Fragility Unit. Um, and thank you for the World Bank for, for having us here today. Um, as Ozon said, the context. So we all know about the 2019 OECD DAC recommendation on the HDP Nexus. That was essentially about a need to rethink the way we work in FCV settings. It was really a, an exciting way to change the way we look at crises to a much more proactive um, prioritizing of prevention approach. It was about breaking down silos between sectors because we know that there is a low glass ceiling for how much different communities can do in an isolated way alone. So it was about complementarity, it was about coherence, and it was about coordination. Since then, adherents have made some progress um, towards implementing this nexus approach with an emphasis on the peace pillar, and this was highlighted recently by um, our OECD report on coordinating across the HDP nexus, um, and we know that this is, this is essentially what we're here to discuss today, and we're going to hear examples of, of how it's being done. Um, but our way of working together is not evolving enough. Um, efforts to integrate the peace component across the HDP are still at a very early stage, and our OECD INCAF monitoring report of the implementation of the HDP Nexus recommend, recommendation, um, which has just been um, approved and will soon be published uh, or declassified online, highlights this. One way is that the strategic coordination between development and humanitarian staff and peace actors is not there yet. Another way, peace and prevention objectives still rarely are still rarely intentionally considered in development programming. Um, in 2022, the DAC bilateral ODA towards peace in fragile contexts fell to less than 10% of total ODA for fragile contexts. That's the lowest share of peace ODA towards fragile contexts since 2006. Mixed programs, which include that peace component, are still also at a very early stage. Only a few adherents to the DAC recommendation have adopted financing instruments that are agile enough to mobilize rapid support for the peace pillar. So there's still, still work to be done, done um, towards, towards forging, forging that integrated approach, um, and we've talked about it a lot. Um, INCAF, um, the OECD INCAF is undertaking work to look at how to do that, how to anchor the peace dimension more strongly in efforts of the development and humanitarian dimensions. Um, part of this is around convening the different actors across the community and that's what the communities and that's what we're doing today. 
um, to, to break down those language barriers um, and to discuss better the, the sort of way to incentivize the, the change um, that ultimately um, is, is, is still lacking. So I'm going to pass to Ozong to, to steer this discussion and thanks for being here. Yes, thank you, Eloise, for that really helpful um, scene setter. Um, so let me, let me introduce our panel. So we have David Grisley, who is the outgoing um, UN resident coordinator for Yemen. Um, we have the managing director for GIZ, Ingrid Hoven. And then we have retired Lieutenant, with Lieutenant Colonel, Lieutenant General, via way of the Royal Netherlands Army, NATO, and MINUSMA. Okay, welcome. Um, so we are hoping to structure the conversation around three ideas. Okay, the first one is about the, the comparative advantage of HDP actors to contribute towards building resilience and supporting peace outcomes. The second one is about the lessons learned for improving the mechanics of coordination across the HDP in conflict settings. And then finally, um, we're gonna talk about the next steps for improving approaches to prevention and peace building through a nexus approach. Um, so let me turn to you first, David. You've just finished your work in Yemen, where you served as UN resident coordinator. I'll let you address in more um, detail the co complexity of the current situation in Yemen. Um, but to briefly set the scene, the situation is one of no war, no peace, with humanitarian needs exceeding $2 billion, um, funding constraints, very low levels of dev development assistance due to the conflict, and the current regional escalation in the, re in the Red Sea could deepen the Yemeni humanitarian crisis and potentially derail the ongoing peace, peace efforts. So um, reflecting on your recent experiences, how do you consider the comparative strengths and expertise of different nexus actors operating in, this, in, in Yemen to strengthen its resilience and support the transition to peace um, in particular, how can different actors help lay the groundwork for sustainable peace in Yemen through efforts to address the economic dimensions of its conflict at um, national and, and local level? Uh, well, thank you very much for, for the question. I, I, I believe the microphone's working well, so I'll go ahead and start maybe with a small story, if that's okay, a yeah, short one. Yeah. Um, I remember when I first went to Yemen in February 2021, and um, I went to my first meeting um, as the resident coordinator, and the topic at hand was the triple nexus. And I was asked my opinion of the triple nexus. Now, at that point, I thought the triple nexus was something to do with the Winter Olympics and ice skating or something of that nature. But I, I faked it long enough to realize that it had to deal with the humanitarian development and, and peace building or security uh, components. And I go, oh, that's just like our comprehensive approach we used to do in Congo. And then it reminded me that every place I've been, there's been a different name. Uh, going back even to 2004 or five, when I first went to uh, South Sudan, they were there they were talking about swimming in three different streams. So there's multiple ways of, of talking about this. But I think the core issue today that you would like us to address is how do we make that practical, moving away from jargon to actual uh, implementation. So let me, you, you asked me two questions. So the first question is, in terms of uh, comparative advantages of each actor. And that implies by that question uh, that none of us are whole and each of us have to work together in order to achieve. Uh, we, we emphasize our, our comparative advantage, but we need the others to succeed. And I think that's a critically important one. Um, I'll just go down the list very quickly of the major actors, uh, external actors. Uh, uh, there's a whole uh, set of issues dealing with um, you know, uh, people of the public, the authorities, and so forth in, in such a situation, but I'll focus on external actors at this point. So the United Nations, let's start with the United Nations. I think its key comparative advantage is the fact that it's widely dispersed on the ground, uh, has access to places that 
many other organizations do not and has the opportunity, if it seizes it, to really get to know the local context in a way that other external actors will struggle to do. Uh, and that provides a tremendous uh, comparative advantage for guiding um, um, other efforts by, by uh, external actors. So I would say the ground-based reality that the UN can provide through its very dispersed um, uh, operations in complex emergencies is a distinct advantage. Uh, often logistics goes with that, but that's a second, uh, second advantage. Uh, if we go to the World Bank, the World Bank IMF, they provide tremendous policy uh, capacity, uh, funding, uh, also substantial funding, um, as well as a good um, understanding of economic drivers of the, of the conflict, etc. cetera, uh, but often a bit weak on the security side, and they have often reached out to me in my previous jobs to complement that. And I really think the, the first two, the UN and the World Bank, provide a very powerful uh, combination in these situations, and, and I found that that often has become the nucleus of how we come together. The, uh, the other elements I would highlight would be the various embassies involved, uh, and they bring a certain, uh, not a certain, a considerable political expertise uh, that is very useful to tap into and to link to. Uh, in these crises, the humanitarian action is usually the most dominant thing on the ground in terms of activity, um, and unfortunately it tends to overshadow a bit the development side uh, because of, of that size. Um, but uh, certainly, they also have reach and knowledge uh, locally that can be uh, can be uh, built too. However, they often guard their space very uh, carefully, and so you have to manage that relationship carefully if you want to bring them into into the fold. And finally, the development uh, actors um, tend to have a more marginal role in these circumstances, in part because. You may be operating in areas where there are restrictions on development assistance, but more fundamentally, the conditions are not conducive to the traditional development kind of work. Um, so I, as a brief outline, that's how I would outline it. Now, what, what I discovered in Yemen, and I'll, I'll conclude on this, uh, is that, and I'll give another really very short story to, uh, to describe it, the, the role of the economy and how it has collapsed as a consequence of the war and how it can be an avenue to, to a return to resilience and, and, um, and recovery and stabilization, I think is extremely important. One thing I, I learned very quickly on the ground, there was a concrete uh, cement, excuse me, factory in Yemen um, that had shut down because of fuel restrictions coming in. That factory employed 5,000 people. And without the uh, electricity generated by the fuel oil, uh, there was no uh, reason to run the, the to run the operation, so those people became unemployed. But in addition to those people, several thousand transporters, those people who transported the finished cement to various construction sites, also did not have jobs. And of course, at the construction site, there's no cement, there's not much work that's gonna go on. So you add all that up and you get maybe 20, 25,000 people who are unemployed because of one simple economic fact um, that's driven politically. Um, and, and of course, those are 25,000 households that probably have maybe 100 to 125,000 people. That's a significant impact and a significant driver of why we have humanitarian assistance going on in the country. So focusing on the economy became very important to me and I was pleased with the UNDP uh, as well as the World Food Program had done a lot of work in that area highlighting the kind of constraints on the economy. And so we use that to build an economic framework that underpinned the three elements of the, of the nexus, there I said it, uh, and uh, uh, to try to find ways, even in the context of a civil war, how we could, through political means, address some of these economic constraints that would make the life of individual people, families, communities better. And, and, the, and the fuel oil, we were able to get that fuel oil in, the factory opened, people had their jobs, uh, reducing the humanitarian requirement, increasing their individual resilience, uh, and a, I think a positive factor for hopefully a move towards peace. So I won't go any further than that, but we really use the economy as a driving way of, um, of, of guiding our efforts going forward. What can we do to make this economy better for the people in, in Yemen? Thank you.
Thank you, thank you, David. That's a, a great um, segue to, to Ingrid. Ingrid, um, David just highlighted the relevance of, um, of, of the economy for building resilience and transitioning to peace. So um, in addition to supporting um, sustainable development objectives, we know that ODA can um, directly and indirectly support sustained peace building outcomes when it is delivered in an intentional, conflict sensitive and timely way. Um, so reflecting on your extensive career in bilateral development cooperation, um, how and under which conditions, which conditions can, um, uh, can development strengthen the crisis prevention and peace building capacities of fragile um, and conflict affected states? And how is GIZ um, integrating conflict uh, mitigation and peace building approaches, approaches into its development or transitional development assistance, TDA, project implementation in, com in conflict context? Thank you, Ozon, and uh, let me start by thanking the OECD for having me at this very exciting um, panel. Perhaps a couple of words about GIZ, uh, perhaps not that well known as the World Bank or, or UNDP. GIZ is a public benefit federal enterprise who works in the field of international cooperation and sustainable development. We mainly do capacity building technical assistance on behalf of the German government and the European Commission. So our normal development portfolio ranges from the promotion of the public sector, social security, um, the health um, support, and drives really to more complex settings, just, um, just energy transition and climate, climate protection. Our portfolio is, our main portfolio is actually happening in fragile settings. 35% of our doing is in countries that have an acute crisis, such as Yemen, South Sudan, Somalia. And two thirds of our partner countries we are working in are being considered fragile. So this is now becoming our new normal, quite frankly, um, to deal with the crisis and to reshape our programming and our doing. So what can we do concretely as a development actor in order to embed the ambition of the HDP nexus? Of course, traditionally, a development actor has said, so we address the root causes of conflict, which are still, I think is still true. But we have learned over time that actually, why um, is the fragility increasing? Why do we enter into conflict? And that one of the root causes is actually that the relationship between the state and the society and people has eroded. There is no social contract that would really forge consensus and make sure that the stability of a setting is being maintained. So, and this, when we worked in, in those settings, this go far beyond a technical institution building exercise. It's much more about really bringing the different stakeholders to the table in working together, in listening to the different demands and, and worries at the same time, and make sure that this type of statal fabric can be re, rebuilt slowly. This takes a lot of time, but it's really about creating an environment where a legitimate um, and inclusive social contract can reemerge over time. And sometimes you see slow progress, and in some setting, unfortunately, it get it get worse. So this is one issue. Concretely, when we do work on the ground, of course, we have in many countries that are in a fragile condition, we have to combine different instruments, as you also said, David. No? So we go in in order to stabilize livelihoods. We do cash transfers, for instance and we partner together with other UN organizations. But at the same time, we don't lose sight of the more structural development issues. So for instance, um, and this is, is part of our portfolio from Somalia, Lebanon, Ma Myanmar to Mali, we do a stabilization of livelihoods, this type of cash transfer operations or cash for work operations. And at the same time, we try to Reestablish water infrastructure, try to revitalize local markets so that some economic activity can take place. We take care of an eroded health system. But we don't do this as a development actor and leave like the local 
authorities aside, because this was actually, again, undermine the building up of a social contract. We try, as far as it is feasible and doable, we try to bring in local administration, local municipalities, as far as they're not the, by themselves drivers, drivers of conflict. And this is extremely, extremely important. But of course, additionally, and in those settings where you feel that, of course, you have to do even more, um, we add um, conflict resolution programs um, that may have different, different natures. And in many countries, unfortunately, this is not an add-on, but has become like an additional big package of, of our doing. What is important? Never forget women. In all our doing, we put on a gender lens. This is core and center. I think for many, many years, we have neglected actually the positive factor that women can bring in those, those settings. Um, secondly, as we have now to deal with compounding risks, conflict, climate change, food insecurity, we cannot longer close the eyes about those sectors or programs where we really forcefully from the very beginning have also to deal with conflict issues that might actually underpin a certain setting. So we try really to insert conflict resolution mechanisms and stabilization aspects into all our environmental program. We are facing in so many regions water scarcity, conflicts about arable land and so forth. So unless we deal with those issues, we won't actually stabilize those, those regions. And um, final, finally, um, perhaps um, a final point that I would like, like to raise. Development agencies, of course, for many years, under the guidance of the OECD, we have developed tools, safeguard and gender analysis, standardized tools, in order to look a little bit deeper into the political setting of countries so that we can identify human rights issues, peace issues, and factor them in those, those conflict, possible conflict areas into our analysis in our programming. This was actually um, the do no harm um, approach. So in order to make sure that our programming and our implementation doesn't create additional conflict. I think we have learned over time that is not sufficient. It's about really doing the right analysis to do better. And it's not only to apply those tools and approaches in those settings that are already fragile. Think about many countries that you are perhaps cooperating with that have very beautiful aggregate indicators. But when you look into certain regions and sub-regions, you can still see that conflicts are re-emerging that conflicts not have been resolved over time, that there is a division between parts of the society. And therefore, we are advising our commissioning partners first that this type of analysis is being actually applied in each and every country, and that we actually don't close the eyes, but are more sensitive about those regions, sub-regions, where we still have within an economy that is strong, and perhaps growing still pockets of conflict that can re-emerge. And finally, how do we deal with the new risk of climate change? Actually, we have started to pilot foresight instruments and risk analysis. We have done this in Western Africa and other countries with the primary goal to strengthen local capacity to do better planning and not to start to deal with the crisis, with the drought, with the floods, when they are already in country, but to factor in these emerging and stronger risks that climate change bring to economies and societies into a medium-term planning, to start to invest in prevention, which pays off in any case, and not do this in the time when you're already in the middle of a crisis of food insecurity. So these are like, the five entry points that I wanted to share with the audience, which have changed our doing. It's not perfect yet. In some cases, we are still in a pilot phase, but this we consider as the possibly the most, the most promising avenue for the future.
No, thank you. Thank you, Ingrid. I think we at the African Development Bank could not agree with you more about the social contract, about the importance of building the social contract. You talked about the role of women and the gender lens, the risk of climate change, food security. Those are, those are, those are the right issues indeed, yes. So um, moving on to, to KISS, um, we know how important uh, security objectives are to sustaining peace. Um, however, we've seen in um, Afghanistan and the Sahel um, that international support to peace sometimes has over relied on security actors or over prioritized hard security issues without sufficiently balanced assistance programs that focus on political and development efforts. Um, so with over 40 years of military service um, from Dutch Armed Forces, NATO, UN, um, what are your reflections on the core comparative advantage of security actors in supporting um, stability and peace in fragile contexts? And in which contexts and at which junctures do you see their role in supporting those objectives as, as, um, as most critical? Yeah, thank you very much for, for, for the question and thanks to OECD also for, for uh, the privilege to be part of this panel and to discuss this uh, theme, I think, uh, very relevant. Let me first say a few things about the role of security actors and also to clarify what those security actors are. So security actors can be armed forces. Security actor can also be police force or police advisors. Or, and a third one I do want to mention, a private military company, which is not a nation's institute, but it's a private company that do basically nation institutes type of work. And the role of those security actors can be to actually provide security in a conflict area, but only if the host nation itself is not able to provide protection of civilians, because that's what we are talking about. And of course, protection of civilians is, is, is an important basic condition, in fact, for the population itself, but also to facilitate work on development, uh, stabilizing the country, uh, et cetera, et cetera, and helping the country to get back on its own uh, feet. Um, and the role of security actors can be to advise and assist and train host nation institutions, whether it's armed forces or whether it's uh, the police. So it's good to have that in context. And I do realize that uh, often those security actors draw a lot of attention most of the time, they are uh, numbers already, the biggest component. I've been in Mali uh, 22, 23 as being the commander of the military force, and we had about 14,000 soldiers. But the mission also had about 2,000 civilians and 2,000 police units and or uh, uh, officers. Um, and I've been in Afghanistan 2008, 2009. That was still at the time of the International Security Assistance Force, where there were, we had tens of thousands of troops in the country, quite military dominated. And if I look at that, that was a NATO-led mission, although mandated by the United Nations Security Council, but it was military dominated, although there was a comprehensive approach. So there was also the cooperation with other actors. Now, if I compare that to the UN um, uh, operating in, in Mali, that was a, uh, MINUSMA was a multi-dimensional mission, which is in itself a civil military integrated mission that not only has security actors, but also a political mm -hmm. pillar, a humanitarian pillar, development work, etc., cetera, uh, et cetera. And I think that is important because if you talk about a conflict area, whether it's in the conflict itself or right after, basic security for the population is important and uh, needs to be there to enable or facilitate work of other actors. So that's where um, the role of security actors lies. Uh, and let me also be clear, and I'm a former military, yes, but we are never anywhere for a single military solution because there's never a single military solution for a conflict because most of the time it is more than just you know, a security issue. And it's always important to identify whether there's a role for security actors to identify what is at stake, what are the deeper lying root causes, and then identify whether there's a need for security actors in 
you know, in addition to humanitarian and or uh, development uh, uh, actors. Um, and we also have to realize, and, I, and that applies, I think, for all of us, not just the security actors. Basically, we are always in a conflict area to make ourselves obsolete. We are there to help a country to get back on its own feet, to take care of the security themselves, to take care of basic services for the population, et cetera, et cetera. But basically, security actors have a facilitating uh, role. So in essence, if you talk about the nexus, it is all about cooperation and finding ways and means to cooperate. And I think that's something we'll discuss in the second question. Thanks, because that's very helpful. Um, um, so, I mean, never a single military solution. Um, looking at deep, deeper at the roots, root causes, that's very, um, very, very helpful insight. Um, so let's let's talk about some of the lessons learned for improving the mechanics of coordination across um, HDB, uh, HDP nexus. So, turning to you, David, um, you've served in multiple high-profile UN roles coordinating international responses to different crises, um, including the 2012 food crisis in the Sahel, the large-scale uh, Ebola epidemic in the DRC, and of course your recent role in, in, in Yemen, where you um, worked collaboratively with national, regional, and global level actors to, pre to prevent what could have been a humanitarian and environmental catastrophe by removing a decaying oil tanker of Yemen's Red Sea coast. Um, so, um, reflecting on those experiences, what have you done to ensure um, a better coordination with actors across the HDP in this um, complex settings? And which um, key factors underpin the successful joined up international responses you've contributed to? In, in, in those contexts. Uh, well, thank you very much. Um, let, me, let me give probably two, maybe three, depending on how much time I, I use, examples very quickly. One may be more focused on uh, UN plus partners, one internal to the UN, and then uh, one very short one at the end just to make a, a core point, which is also uh, about how, how you can facilitate people working together. Uh, let me start off with the Yemen experience. Uh, there, uh, I have to say, my initial experience in, in, in Yemen, working with the broader international community, was a bit problematic for a couple of reasons. One, we were based in, in Sana, which was under uh, Houthi control, as everyone uh, probably here knows, with a, a government, recognized government, sometimes in Aden, sometimes in Riyadh with development and humanitarian um, uh, teams based in Amman and embassies based in Riyadh. So we had a geographical dispersion problem to work with, um, to start off with. Um, and then secondly, I, the second constraint that we faced was, well, many of those had difficulty coming into, the, into uh, spending any time inside Yemen. Uh, so we were basically their voice. Uh, I, uh, not their, well, their voice on the ground, but also witness to uh, to them coming back, what we saw. Uh, thirdly, and, and this is one of the more surprising, I found member state governments, it's not across the board, uh, but in too many cases, they had their own silos, particularly between the humanitarian and development side. Um, and it was, it was to the point where, I, whenever I went to Amman to give a brief, um, they asked, as particularly the humanitarians, that I give a separate brief to the humanitarians and a separate brief to the development uh, representatives there. And that, I, I think that gets to the heart of the problem. We have institutional silos that work against even the broader kinds of work that we're talking about. And so it took some time to overcome those constraints, and we ended up organizing basically um, uh, not only technical working groups, uh, but also uh, uh, every two months, we brought everybody together on the humanitarian side, the development side, and the political side. And, and I was really very happy that many ambassadors based in, in, um, in Riyadh flew specifically to Amman to, to work with us on, on these issues. 
fundamentally tying the political to the, to the technical, as I mentioned earlier. And I think that's one of the key lessons is how do you, do you bridge that and how do you articulate issues that politically can be potentially addressed so that the ambassadors can take that up. So we had that very tight kind of relationship that, uh, that evolved over time. And this group was co-chaired by myself, uh, but also the World Bank. And I, as I said before, that's a very powerful combination. Also, Germany co-chaired as a representative of, of the uh, embassies that were there. So uh, that helped really coalesce a common understanding of what we were doing together. I wouldn't call it a major coordinating body, but it certainly brought everybody together to understand and, and also gave the political side some specific objectives to work on, particularly on economic issues that I described before. So that, that, that worked. The second one, it was more internal to the UN. I go back to MINUSCO when I was there. I was the polit political deputy based, uh, co-located with the force commander in the eastern part of the country. And our job was to, to basically uh, work together to solve the protection issues out there um, or mitigate them is probably a better word. Um, and, and we worked together, and I had a series of force commanders I worked with, all very, very uh, capable um, and dedicated. And, and we worked out a comprehensive approach, basically, of how we would pull different mission elements together, including the UN agencies, province by province, to carefully study uh, what the, the particular conflict situation was. There were 100 armed groups at that time in, in the Congo, um, and, and look at what particular strategies could be done uh, to enhance the protection of civilians, but also how we could intervene. And, and we worked out systems to intervene with integrated teams, with the uh, force playing uh, an enabling role, role for the civilians to be on the ground, whether it was human rights work or mediation work or whatever. And so we met every three months on each province to re, uh, review our, our strategy, what worked, what didn't work. And there's a lot that didn't work, but we learned from that. And then uh, come up with an agreement on how we move forward. And our long-term objective was to prepare for a, a drawdown of the mission from uh, different provinces. By the time we left, I think we were down to about four, yeah, four provinces out of 26 that we had withdrawn from. Uh, they, of course, the, 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 the easiest ones, but, uh, but nonetheless, it gave us a pathway to go. Now, the third example, I think I've got time, it'll be very quick, and, and, and we talk about how best to collaborate. When, when I was in South Sudan, I, I moved early into Juba, just after it became the, the designated capital. And what I did was, with very little money and a little support from OCHA, build a major camp uh, which was intended first for OCHA, but then I said, look, we need to bring the UN agencies in, so the UN agencies co-located. And then I got requests from various governments, including the UK and, and the, the European Union, I think Germany, they wanted to be co-located with us. Then we built an office space for our NGOs so that they could come, they were all in Nairobi at the time, so that they could operate. Uh, and so we had a fully integrated compound, and. Um, at one point, we were getting ready to set up a multi-donor trust fund with the World Bank. It's my favorite World Bank uh, story. Uh, it's a good one for World Bank people here. You'll like it. Um, in, in that, uh, I, I pushed to have the World Bank trust fund team located in Juba, not in Nairobi, so that they could work directly with, uh, with the government there instead of being a pull factor back to Nairobi. And the, um, the World Bank uh, representative agreed to that. Of course, he was living in Ethiopia and never would, was going to live in South Sudan. So he agreed for his team to be deployed there. Um, and what I did is I offered them a, a couple of containers, a VSAT, and a place to put tents. And they lived in tents. So th there's a World Bank operating on the ground, South Sudan, 2006, living in tents. Um, and we got along really well. It was really a good way to build a strong camaraderie. camaraderie. Uh, but what I want to say, um, and then I'll come to a conclusion, what I want to say is that somewhere along the line after that, uh, a national representative of Médecins Sans Frontières came to see me. And we were talking. I was saying, guys, I don't understand why you all are still based in Nairobi. You got great teams on the ground, but why are you still in Nairobi? And he gave me all these excuses about money and so forth. And I finally said, you know something? I want to show you something. 
And he goes, what's, what's that? I said, let's just step outside. And so I, we stepped outside, and I said, you see that bamboo fence? Uh, and he goes, yes. The other side is our, where everybody lives that works here. And he goes, oh, okay. And you see those big, tall tents? Because the World Bank brought big tents. You see those big tents over there? That's where the World Bank lives, and their office is right there. Why aren't you here? And he stopped for a long time. He didn't say anything. And finally he said, Mr. Gressley, don't say anything. We'll be here in 30 days. <laughs> this, is, this is how you leverage things. This is how you leverage people coming together. And you create the incentives uh, to do so. So creating incentives, linking the, the technical with the political, being ground-based reality. And I really think the collective work between the World Bank and, and the United Nations is critically important to create a catalyst. And one of the things I did with MINUSCO, I also gave a space to the World Bank to locate its GOMA office on our compound so that we could work together. Physical location really promotes collaboration. So thank you. No, thank you very much. That's a very that's an excellent and concrete example of how you bridge and manage those institutional silos. So that's, that's really uh, very helpful. Um, so Case, this is, a, this is about um, um, how getting to a more cooperat cooperative um, civil military equi equilibrium. Um, so security actors generally do not have development on their radar, right? And we often find that the language of the HDP nexus is unknown to them. Um, while humanitarian and security actors are increasingly coordinating around protection, such as uh, through the UNCM Accord, the relationship between security actors and development actors is still less developed. Um, we, know part, we know that part of the reason for the, the, the rigidity of silos that, um, that David was, was talking about is, is inherently because of their different DNA. They have you know, diverging mandates, objectives, operational tempos, language, risk appetites, and ways of working. Um, so what lessons have you drawn across your lengthy um, military career on where there's um, opportunity to inform and coordinate between security actors and other actors across the nexus? Um, what advice would you give based on, on what's worked and what's, what, what's not worked? Um, you can speak about HQ level as well as on the ground um, to enable more coherence and coordination between um, military and civilian actors. Very relevant, thank you. And I could talk for an hour on this. I will not do so. I will try to stay within about uh, four to five minutes. Basically three element, elements, and I will explain each of them. We have to meet before the crisis. It is about unity of effort and leadership makes the difference. It's set because it sets the tone. Let me, let me elaborate on each of those. We need to meet before the crisis, basically meaning we have to get to know one another. Because like you said, different DNA. But I can't read your DNA on the internet or on, on you know, the World Wide Web or whatever. I have to meet you so you can explain where your DNA is coming from. And I can explain to you where my DNA is coming from. So we understand each other's background, each other's culture, each other's differences of looking at things. We have to get to know one another so we understand each other better before we actually need to work together in a, a crisis. That also means that we have to be willing to step over our boundaries. And we have to willing, be willing indeed to acknowledge the fact that we have different DNA and there's nothing wrong with the DNA of the other. Uh, that's also a, a point. And we have to ignore or set aside possible biases. We military sometimes have biases against humanitarian or development actors. But it's the same the other way around. A lot of the humanitarian the development actors have bias against the military. Get over it. <laughs> really, get over it. No, and it also takes two to tango. What I'm saying is from both sides, we need to be able to step uh, forward and get over it. Um, so we have to build the relationship, so we have to reach out. Um, 
and, and, and while on the ground, we have to look for that unity of effort, find ways and means to coordinate. And once we know each other better, that's already a first step and an important condition to have a more effective coordination and cooperation. And we have to be willing to exchange information and uh, to cooperate uh, our efforts and see how we can complement one another if necessary. Who is doing what? Who is doing what piece of what needs to be done in the conflict area that we are uh, uh, willing? Um, and I can give you an example about that meet before the crisis and that, that coordination as well. And, 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 and I will touch upon leadership uh, too. Leadership, like I said, builds the bridges. It sets the tone. If leaders don't do it, if don't, leaders don't reach out to other organizations, who will? Don't think your organization will do it by itself. No, no, you have to provide the example. So you have to reach out. Before I went to Mali, I visited Geneva and I visited a number of organizations like UNHCR, UNHCR, uh, ICRC, Interpeace and whatever others to meet them, to get to know them. When I was in Afghanistan, we organized uh, a meeting on a weekly basis to inform other actors that were working in our province about the security situation. And it was up to them whether they would come or not, but it also provided an opportunity to do coordination. And I also realized that some humanitarian organizations or some development organizations don't want to be seen with the military. But I think we can find ways and means to work around that. And a final example, when I was in Afghanistan, my Dutch government had decided that the mission should have also a more civilian face. So they decided that they wanted to say that we don't want just the military officer to be in the lead, but we want a civilian representative next to him, so we have dual leadership. It worked. I had a very good colleague from the Department of Foreign Affairs. We invested in each other to get to know each other better, and we made a few uh, arrangements for ourselves. We were sitting in one office, but we said to each other, when we have the door closed, we have to talk, uh, be able and willing to talk about anything openly. But as soon as we leave this room, we speak as one voice. And it works. That is investing in the relationship, and that is stepping over your own boundaries. And sometimes you have to give up a little bit about your own domain. And to be not the typical military or not the typical humanitarian worker. Yeah. No, hearing you loud and, loud and clear, so um, uh, let go of the bias, um, meet before the crisis, reach out, unity of effort and leadership matters. Yeah, those are, those are very helpful, important, important tips. Um, so back to you, um, Ingrid, to talk about um, bridging interdepartmental silos. Um, uh, although donors widely subscribe to the HDP Nexus, uh, we know that there are age-old obstacles to interagency coordination, including when it comes to peace. Um, one, of those, one of these obstacles is that peace is not a sector in itself. Uh, so even when the ultimate objective of donor engagement in crisis context is supporting the achievement of um, the kind of peaceful conflict resolution you talked about, it can be hard to coordinate peace actions within a grand plan as a broad range of um, national and international actors, um, uh, not, just security, not, not just security actors uh, on, undertake them. So um, what has GIZ learned from its recent engagements in fragile or conflict-affected contexts about the um, approaches for promoting broader alignment and coherence with other um, HDP actors? And how is it applying these lessons in its um, develop development programming in the Sahel, for example? Thank you so much. I'm, I'm coming in a minute to the Sahel, but I would like to refer to Cornelia's points on Afghanistan. I think that the provincial reconstruction teams were quite a new ecosystem, and it was really an environment where we really had a very um, big learning curve, um, all the actors involved. Um, um, and, and what we added in Germany, to speak about beyond GIZ, about the German system, um, having considered what is needed um, in those contexts, is the German government created um, an 
interministerial coordination group on conflict resolution and crisis prevention. It com is composed by the Ministry of Foreign Affairs, the Ministry of Defense, by the Ministry of Development, um, and I forgot one, sorry, but a couple of, I mean, this is an interministerial steering committee that is, has developed guidelines for working in fragile settings um, so that we better understand each other and that we share those approaches and strategies. In inclusion, they have added an advisory body where GIZ is a member, so that we also, in the, on the implementing side, we share actually the same vision and the same approaches and we try to overcome the silos and perhaps the hesitations to work with each other. And listening and a lot of time for dialogue is absolutely essential. Coming to the Sahel. I would like to share a nice example with you. We looked at the Sahel where we need more impact of our doing. We found that the WFP and UNICEF and GIZ, we all three agencies have a big footprint in the same regions, in the same countries, especially in Niger and South Sudan. So we thought, well, that's a good idea. Why shouldn't we work closer together? And we convinced the Ministry for Economic Cooperation and Development that they should consider a joint approach. So far, so good. And they were really actually excited and committed to do so. And then they looked into the different budget lines because WFP, UNICEF, and GIZ, we have different budgetary regulations and possibilities, different rules and procedures, and different compliance systems. So this was the first obstacle. Do we find a budget line that would allow the ministry to commission the three institutions for one joint program at the same time? Ha. Huh. Easier said than done. This again took time to figure out what could it be. Because if you take the traditional budget lines, in each institution follows its own institutional logic and procedures and programming exercises. And this is difficult to bring together and to align. So we found this specific budget line. We agreed on the joint framework and on a joint monitoring framework and joint indicators data collection and reporting. And it really makes sense and it can make a difference. For instance, WFP is concentrating on school fielding, feeding. And if then GIZ works in the same communities, in the same municipalities and sub-regions on, for instance, economic activities, um, resilience in the agricultural sector, this makes sense because it strengthens the resilience of families and people and then at the end, the resilience is going to be bigger than if you just concentrate on one humanitarian action. But the transaction costs were high. I'm very frank to you. No? Although we shared the same vision, the same concepts, but in order to overcome those administrative hurdles, it took us almost two years to come together. Um, and really, we were decisive in doing this because we were really partnering for years and we had a strong ministry that said, look, we want to see this happening as a test case, as a pilot, and then we want to scale it up. So I think we have to be honest, quite frankly, uh, unless we get more flexibility embedded in our authorizing environment that we are operating in. It takes us a long enough time to do something which makes absolutely sense is it's more impactful instead of working not in partnerships and not joining efforts. So these are the lessons learned. We continue to work in, into this direction and we hope that by proving that it makes sense and facilitating, um, I mean, overcoming those administrative hurdles that perhaps then the whole system may change to the better and we can convince parliamentarians and those that decide about different budget lines that perhaps a bit more flexibility, especially in times that become more difficult, could make really sense. Yeah, so um, let's talk about next steps in improving peace building and prevention through the nexus. So I want to challenge you all to take a few hypothetical scenarios. Um, Kiss. 
Let's say you are in an elevator with both the Dutch Minister of Foreign Affairs and the Minister of Defense. You have 60 seconds to convince them of one key practical way to reinforce an integrated approach to peace and stability on the ground, leveraging the different strengths of their ministries and personnel. What's your pitch? Dear Excellencies, <laughs> if you want to mitigate the risks of political failure, and if you want to be in a position that you can go to Parliament and explain the success of the approach in a conflict area, make sure that you invest in the relationship with all the actors involved so that we get to know each other better, that we meet before the crisis so we can have the dialogue, we build the network, and that we can be effective collaboratively. Mm. Sounds good, yeah. Thank you. <laughs> it's a great pitch. Um, well, David, you find yourself in a room full of future UN res, uh, resident coordinators who are about to deploy to um, various fragile contexts, okay? So you have 60 seconds to share with them a key piece of advice for how they can help facilitate a more joined up approach on the ground in, suppo in support of local resilience and upstream um, prevention capacities of national actors. What would you say to them? Good luck. <laughs> <laughs> Actually, make your luck. Um, no, I, what, I would, I, what I would say basically is you have in your job description that you have the convening power uh, to pull partners together. But that's only on a piece of paper. You need to make that convening power real, and you can make that power real through many different ways. But for me, the most important way I found is to be on the ground, go to places no one else has gone, talk to people who have no one else is talking to, marginalized groups in particular, understand, listen, listen, and listen. When I first go to a country, I spend most of my time traveling around, and I'll spend all day listening and not talking. I've never learned anything when I talk, like right now. So that would be my core advice. Get out there, understand, listen, synthesize, and you can take that back, and people will come knocking on your door. Thank you. Very helpful, thank you. Um, um, over to you, Ingrid. So, Ingrid, you are invited to a forum, let's say like the sixth edition of the Africa Resilience Forum in Abidjan next year. That's an example, right? And you're asked to identify in 60 seconds one major change in the system you would want to see take place before 2030 that could um, enable more collective, coherent responses across the HTP nexus towards preventing the outbreak of violent conflict. What would you say? Well, I would possibly say um, let's have less meetings about coordination and uh, dialogue um, because I have um, stopped to count the panels and meetings we had on what we have to do in order to make the ADP next HDP nexus work. I would say concentrate on the doing on the ground, overcome the boundaries, um, your silos, concentrate on people and try to do the utmost possible to really to save people and planet. We are living in a situation where we don't have the luxury anymore to somehow to stick to the old traditional way of doing business. Um, the new new normal requires more innovative and I would say um, unorthodox approaches. And unless we are willing to do so and have the political commitment and leadership to let us do those that are implementing, it, it won't happen for the better for people and planet. Thank you, thank you. Um, un unfortunately, we're, we're out of time, so I'm gonna take two seconds. Huh? We don't have time for questions, unfortunately. So, yes, yes, yes. A couple of questions, yes, yes. So, two on this side, and I think, I think we're gonna combine the questions just to make this more um, cogent. Let, let's go over there in the back. Um, yes, you wanna start? Um. Um, 
Thank you so much. My name is Habib Mayer. I am um, from DG Sound Plus, and I also co-lead the HTTP Nexus Coalition. Very quick question on whenever we talk about the HTTP uh, Nexus, we always stand that each of these three actors overstep in others' roles, and including security. Given giving the example of PRTs in Afghanistan, I really, really hope that it's not repeated anywhere else in the world. It fragmented. It was the biggest source of fragmentation. I'm from Afghanistan, so I have the authority to talk about it. And it was number of states within the state. It delegitimized the state that was supposed to be supported by the international uh, actors. So my first question was in relation to the same, that where you you bring the security actors and they assume the role of development and humanitarian actors. So I, I, I really don't know if it is the good example that we will have to be talking here about it. So the dilemma is how can we make them sub, you know, focus on their core areas of humanitarian development and peace, but joint assessment of you know, joint planning of, of the HDP. That's, that's very quick, thank you. Yeah, okay. One more on this side, was there another, was there a hand up on this side? Okay, I see you um, right there, the, yes, sir, please. And then the sir, you, you're, you're, you get the third question. Yes, so you, could, you could stand behind the, the lady, yes, okay. go ahead, yeah. Oh, hi, uh, Marta Guerrero from Refugees International. Uh, I'm actually co-authoring a study on coordination between MDBs and humanitarian actors on refugee issues. And believe me, it just seems like an impossible task at some times. Uh, so uh, first of all, thank you for all the contributions. And I wanted to ask a very key question about the role of localization, not to make it even more complicated to coordinate UN security development actors, but what is the role of local actors in this nexus? What is the role of local organizations, and especially like local people to hear the voices from the ground beyond just consultative, checking a box and really engaging them in the solution? Okay. okay. Got it. Yes. Yeah. Very thank brief, please. Very thank brief. you, Madam Moderator. I'm yes. Mr. Baruzzi, involved in the peace building and conflict prevention and cooperation for development. It's only to confirm what Madam Ingrid just said, because uh, since 2021, we have an uh, European humanitarian forum in Brussels, and many beneficiary countries were complaining the, the difference between the portfolio for development and the portfolio for humanitarian uh, Side. And for them, if there is an emergency and there is a cooperation co uh, in program, this should uh, benefic be, be beneficiary. But from donor or partner side, that difference makes this a problem for them. Thank yes, you. Yes, thank you. Um, you want to take 30 seconds each, maybe? Yeah, maybe first the, the question related to the PRT experience in Afghanistan, the first question. Um, I, I tend to agree with you. Um, the mission in Afghanistan at that, in, the, in that phase was pretty military dominated and we tried to find a comprehensive approach and of course the UN was active with UNAMA but you hardly saw um, them and I'm putting it a little bit black and white. Uh, so that was pretty much military uh, uh, dominated, uh, I agree with that. And another thing is, I think we try to too much implement what we thought was good. I think there's an important role, and that needs to be also a lesson for the future, that we engage with national, mm -hmm. regional, local authority levels in nations um, and have them as much as possible in the lead or in the driver's seat. And we support their efforts wherever there's a need to support them instead of us international community doing things that we think are helpful. Now, nations have to say what they think is helpful for them. Mm, yes, thank you. Ingrid, 30 seconds. I would very briefly pick up the, the question raised on localization, absolutely co-center. Yeah. When you work in those regions, you have to bring in different stakeholders, the youth, the women, the elder, um, people in, in communities, and they are feasible really bring them together with local authorities, test whether there is a re-emerging of dialogue and working together. Sometimes we use like funds to finance 
smaller infrastructure measures, a market, a street, a health post, but the core ingredient in order to support dialogue is really that we ask them to have a joint planning exercise, to sit together um, and then decide what should be done. And by doing so, perhaps then people start again to trust each other and to work together, and therefore localizing development starting from the bottom-up approach is so core and center yeah. to peace building. Yeah. yeah, thanks, Ingrid. David, anything to add? Um, well, one, I've never worked in Afghanistan, uh, but I've talked to many who have, and they seem deeply scarred by the term PRT. So um, the only thing I would say is not everything outside of Ang Afghanistan is a PRT, because there is sometimes a reaction that, is this a new PRT approach? And, and generally the answer is not, and I could give some very concrete and very unfortunate examples of that. Uh, more to the point on localization, uh, once again, uh, critically important. What we try to do in Yemen is several things to promote that. Uh, on the coordination level, we broadened our UN country, excuse me, our humanitarian country team to include, uh, I think it was six or seven, I think, um, national uh, NGOs uh, on board, so pretty, pretty uh, substantial. We also require that two of them be at least uh, women-led organizations. And then through our humanitarian fund, almost 50% of our funding went directly, not through anybody, any other entity, but directly to national NGOs. And we opened satellite offices throughout the country uh, to do two or three things. One, identify good local NGOs, because sometimes we could be focused on capital-based NGOs, and yet there are very good groups out there that might otherwise be marginalized. And to work with them on capacity building that they want, not what we want, uh, on how to train them how to do our grant requests, but what the issues are that they, they want, and they're very explicit on that, and to work collectively so that they're more uh, uh, sustained in the long run without that dependency on our funding coming in. So um, that kind of decentralized local localization, if I could call it that, I think also needs to be taken into account, and the long-term sustainability of those uh, organizations has to be uh, foremost in our mind if we're going to leave anything behind meaningful. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Yes, thank you so much. This has been a very rich uh, conversation. Um, we heard to uh, the range of advice that was given by our, our friends up here. Um, uh, step over your boundaries, ignore bias, improve mutual understanding, reach out, build relationships, unity of effort, we need each other. Um, we need to assist member states to break down silos um, that exist. Um, let's have a common and holistic vision. Let's be preventive, let's be integrated, and let's be transformative. Um, thank you to our excellent panel, and um, let's continue to have the conversation over the next couple of days. Thank you very much.